Today, getting better economic outcomes with Senator Gerald Rennick. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to the latest post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Today, I'm joined by Senator Rennick. Hi, Senator. Hey, you going, Martin? Very good. Thank you so much for coming back on. And look, I wanted to pick up your recent outings uh, in the Senate because there were so many important points that, that came up. But before we get into the detail, just a quick comment from you. We spent $300 billion or so around COVID, a lot of money thrown into the economy, but did it hit the right places? Uh, I, I don't think so. I mean, I've been arguing for years that we should, shouldn't be afraid to expand the volume of credit domestically rather than rely on foreign US dollars or, you know, whoever owns the Federal Reserve dollars. Um, and yet, you know, and I, and I argue, I mean, I, I consider myself from the protectionist wing of the Liberal Party and I'm probably about the only remaining member of the protectionist wing in the Liberal Party. Um, they've all been taken over by Redians or free traders. Um, but uh, we, we, you know, I've been trying to get them for years to understand that you can debit asset credit equity, you know, and, and one of the things you taught at university is that you can't print money out of thin air. Well, that's a complete oxymoron because all money comes out of thin air. The question is what you secure that credit against. Um, and as a sovereign country, you know, there's two types of credit on the balance sheet. There's either debt or there's equity. As a sovereign country, we have equity over all of those untapped resources, uh, including things that come from the air for free, which is rain, uh, sunlight, you know, the soil, the minerals in the soil. So, you know, if we wanted to grow our, our uh, economy productively, we need to actually build infrastructure uh, assets that, you know, like dams, uh, power stations, um, et cetera, that uh, tap that untapped untapped wealth um, and you can do that because uh, it, it's we as a sovereign country we have title over those assets and I, I just don't know why um, but what we so after years of arguing with my colleagues as to you know why they believe they that shouldn't happen they went and hit the panic button with COVID and printed 300 billion dollars to basically shut the economy down um, which is you know and I don't want to go down too far down the vaccine path but you know, the working age population was never at a large risk from, you know, serious disease. So, uh, you know, we printed $300 billion to effectively destroy the economy over the long term. And it's going to take a very long time for our children to repay that debt. And the only way out of that, in my view, is to basically build. I mean, if you went to a desert island, got washed up on a desert island, you wouldn't go, well, let's not build a dam because it might cause inflation or it might impact our AAA credit rating. You'd go, we've got to build a dam or whatever, secure our water supply, secure our food supply, etc., cetera, um, to survive. Uh, and today we live in a world where the tail wags dogs and we're driven by things like AAA credit ratings and, and inflation and things like that. And, and inflation is important. But as I try to say to people that if we build more assets that supply more water, supply more power, supply better roads, we'll actually increase the supply of goods and services Um as opposed to, and you know, through a productivity measure, we'll control inflation rather than what the RBA is doing, which is they're trying to basically impose an austerity measures to, to smash demand because supply has dropped off for, you know, Russia, you know, too much renewables, whatever. Um, uh, and, and that's the wrong way of doing it. We, we, we need to be smart about what we do and we need to increase productivity. And if we increase productivity, increase the supply of essential services, we'll actually you know, increase supply, which will match demand, reduce inflation, and not only that, uh, if we lower the price of um, power and water and things like that, we'll actually become more competitive uh, as a country as well, and, and especially for our, our small small businesses especially. Uh, they'll be able to stay afloat. So the critical point there is that if you're going to spend, you've got to spend the money on the right things, right? There are yeah. right yeah. ways and there are wrong ways. And unfortunately, some of the neoliberal philosophies seem to me to drive spending in precisely the wrong ways. Well, well I mean, pretty much the, uh, that, that's correct. Uh, and we focus too much on consumption and, and particularly in regards to house prices. So uh, I've got numbers from uh, Treasury or the Parliamentary Library. The increase in foreign debt held by the banks from 1985 to 2008 and the increase from $8 billion to $800 billion dollars uh, in that 30-odd year period, or no, 23-year period, um, 
and it nearly all got pumped into the housing market. And all that did was effectively increase house prices from an average of four to five times average earnings to you know, somewhere around 10 to 12 times average earnings, depending on which part of the country you live in. Uh, and you know, w- what have we got? We've had asset inflation, uh, which, of course, has never been recorded in the CPI because they don't count the cost of housing uh, or, or existing housing. Uh, so, um, yeah, the, the, the money the money has gone into the wrong wrong areas and, and mainly housing, um, which is all that's done. It's made it harder for uh, our, our younger generations to get into the market, number one. And number two, uh, it's, it's imposed a very unfair tax system because the same year Keating opened up the economy to foreign debt, he also introduced capital gains with an exemption for the primary principal class of residents. Uh, and so, you know, you've got your, your millionaires sitting in the eastern suburbs of uh, Sydney and the richer suburbs of Melbourne who've seen their house prices climb by millions. And they'll re- when, when they realise that, they'll, they'll pay no tax. Meanwhile, the, the low income earner on 50 or 60 grand a year who gets out of bed every day and puts his nose to the grindstone and might have to drive an hour each way to work. Uh, he's paying tax, you know, 20 cents in the dollar up to uh, 45000 uh, and then it's, what is it now, 32 cents uh, above 40, 45000 uh, and, and you're not even breaking even until you hit 50 grand a year anyway. So, you know, these guys are getting taxed below their um, uh, rate, you know, economic survival rate, while, you know, you've got wealthy, wealthy people, affluent people who pay no tax at all on their capital gains, which I just think is completely outrageous. Well, let me take that slightly further because one of the observations you made a couple of weeks ago, again in the Senate, related to superannuation and the fact that the superannuation system appears to be set up in a way that actually doesn't benefit ordinary people. That's exactly right. So if you look at the budget papers, the combined uh, superannuation tax benefits are almost the, is almost $50 billion. I'm going off the May figures. I haven't looked at the October numbers yet, but it'll still be around $50 billion. Most of that will go to the upper 20 20 or 30 percent of income earners, uh, and I fail to see that how that helps people on the pension or the bottom 70 percent of uh, income earners slash retirees, um, who, who the whole purpose of setting up superannuation was to get people off the pension. But yet we've seen after almost 30 years of super now that the number of people on the pensions dropped from about 77 percent to low 70s, um, and and about two or three percent of that was when Morrison changed the index. Asian figures uh, in 2018, I think it was. So it hasn't reduced the pension by a lot. Um, and so, yes, yet again, I mean, the two biggest ca- tax concessions uh, in the budget papers are principal place of residence, and I'm not suggesting that we should tax low, you know, houses below two or three million. I'm talking about the top end of town here, um, not your average Joe Blow, um, uh, and, and superannuation benefits. So, you know, the, the, the biggest tax benefits go to the, the wealthiest people. And, and the problem with that is, is that, that this wealth uh, has a low rate of velocity in the economy. I mean, if you were to give a tax cut, say, to example, for people on low income, so I, I firmly believe that, that that would cost the budget next to nothing because they'd spend everything, low income earners spend everything they earn anyway. So the money would soon come back in the form of GST or increased company tax and it just would, would you know, cycle through the economy anyway. So, um, yeah, we've got some serious budget issues. But, you know, that that asset inflation that we've had over the last thirty years, and and the you know the fact now that younger income earners have to spend you know everything they save, they have to now pay off interest uh, or, or, or buy a house that you know. In, well, obviously we all need a house to live in. It's very important to own a house. You know, still tick number one priority. Um, you know, it's it's we don't want to make it so that. Uh, it becomes a tax haven in itself at the expense of the productive part of the economy. Because at the end of the day, if you want to own your house, you need to have a job, you know, coming, you know, have a job. And if, if we focus too much on housing at the expense of productivity or consumption at the expense of productivity, all our jobs will go offshore, as a lot of them have in the last 30 years. Uh, and people, you know, when, when the next crunch happens and, it, you know, it's starting to kick in now, you know, people will lose their jobs, then they'll struggle to pay their mortgage. So it's really important that the economy stays very productive and that we have a tax system that encourages productivity first and foremost over consumption. Now let me switch the conversation on a little bit because uh, the Reserve Bank used a facility called the Term Funding Facility, which essentially gave very cheap money to the commercial banks through the uh, COVID period when interest rates were ultra low. 
Um, so they got it at 0.25 or 0.1%. They're still sitting a lot of that money. Um, yeah. It's sitting back at the exchange settlement account at the Reserve Bank now, along with a lot of other funds. And the Reserve Bank is now paying them, well, a very large amount to hold that. Um, what do you think of this term funding facility and what should be done about it? Well, the RBA need to be criticised and the banks need to be called out for it. And I actually think they should repay uh, some of that, those, uh, you know, what, what you call free money. I mean, it's effectively um, a subsidy to the banks. And I think Michelle Bullock pretty much admitted that to my colleague, Senator Matt Kennevin, last week. Uh, and, and we should use that. First of all, we should use that as the leverage. Is that the RBA can lend to private institutions and, you know, call out to all the free marketeers here, tell us that the private market's more efficient. Well, these private banks were bailed out. Well, weren't bailed out. They weren't necessarily going to go broke. They've been given, you know, discounted, heavily discounted uh, cheap money that they can either repark with the RBA overnight, I think at 3.25% now, is it 3.35%, or they can lend out at, you know, current rates of up to 5 to 6%, I believe, um, you know, on some products at the moment. So that is a massive uplift on, you know, 188 billion. So I don't know what that, the average weight of lending, you know, um, interest rate on that's laid out, but let's say it's 3%. Well, that's still at a $6 billion subsidy a year. Um, step one. So, you know, they've made a lot of free money that I think they should repay, um, step one. But number two, uh, if the RBA can lend to the private sector, um, taxpayer, and, and, you know, the taxpayer has to pick up the bill for this ultimately, why can't they lend to state governments on the condition that state governments invest in solid, hardcore assets that generate productivity gains like dams or power stations um, or, or, you know, railway lines or courts or airports? Um, and this is what we've been calling for a long time, um, you know, is to use our sovereign capital to back our sovereign wealth. Um, so, you know, double standards here from the RBA and, you know, the neoliberals, and they're not just in the in the... Liberal Party, there a lot of neoliberals in the Labor Party too nowadays. Um, you know, the forefathers of both parties must be rolling in their graves at some of the stuff these guys believe in today. Um, you know, it's all paper shuffling, pen pushing, pushing, and verbal diarrhea over genuine. Um, you know, um, you know, late, you know, back in the workers and the small business people of the world, uh, which do um, generate our wealth. So, um, yeah, I guess there are two two angles. Is number one, you know, we, we've given it. Uh, um, subsidy to the private sector and a very wealthy part of the private sector in our banks. And step two, uh, if we're happy to do that, why can't we then, uh, you know, give state governments subsidised cheap loans on the condition that those loans are secured against nation-building assets? Yeah, and it's worth reflecting. It's something like three billion. I think I did a quick back of an envelope calculation that the taxpayer is effectively continuing to throw at the banks, which goes to their bottom line. And it's interesting that up in the eurozone, the eurozone is because had a, they had a somewhat similar uh, feature. They're now actually speaking with the banks about how they unwind it. So they're not saying it's got to run to its course. They're going to unwind it early. And that's an object lesson, I think, in not allowing the Reserve Bank to sort of just sort of say, well, it was that back then and we'll let it run off. We need a more proactive stance, I think. Yeah, and, and there's a third element to that that sort of just occurred to me, and that is who holds the RBA accountable? Um, you know what I mean? Like it, it's these guys are accountable. Like many independent statutory authorities, I've realised it sounds all very nice when you hear it the first time, but they're independent. But ultimately, they're also unaccountable. And as we heard last week in estimates, I asked some questions. I, I put some uh, requests in, like questions on notice last time in estimates to get correspondence between the RBA and the Bank of International Settlements, and the RBA won't provide that information. And they admit that it's a confidential confidentiality uh, issue. Um, but, you know, I want to know, does the RBA talk to other central banks about, for example, setting exchange rates? You know, and, and, and if that's the case, why does the RBA get to settle exchange rates with unelected foreign bankers uh, when Keating, you know, when they floated the dollar, it was all about free markets and, you know, we're going to let float, the, float the dollar and let the market work it all out, um, when really it turns out that the market isn't, well, I just strongly suspect the market isn't actually working it out. I suspect there's an agreement between all central banks as to where each country's exchange rate will be set. Um, and and to, a, to a degree, I'm not necessarily against that, um, provided it's accountable and transparent 
um, and it's also and, and but to do that that should therefore be set by the parliament of the day um, to have a range because you know when we outsource we've now outsourced control of our exchange rate which is a very important economic uh, factor uh, and, and driver of the economy to unelected bankers with no accountability or transparency. Uh, well, if there is going to be an oversight or a control mechanism, it should be through the parliament or, or at least the treasurer slash executive. Um, so yet again, it's another classic example of, um, you know, bureaucrats, uh, you know, basically holding the reins, you know, controlling the reins of power in this country and not actually elect representatives. Yeah, and it is worth reflecting, you know, central banks got the memo from somebody to say take interest rates really low, and then they've got a more recent memo saying lift interest rates, and the question is how independent are those decisions and to what extent does entities like the BIS, for example, have an influence or, uh, may I say, control on some of those decisions? Um, and objectively, how are those decisions derived at? Yeah, that's exactly right. And given that the biggest central bank in the world is the Federal Reserve... Uh, whose ownership structure is not clear. Um, and it should be noted that a lot of the profits from the Federal Reserve do get paid back to the Treasury. Um, but, of course, if you're clipping 2% of the margin, so I know retail banks here in Australia work on about a 2% net interest rate margin plus fees, um, but still 2% of, say, $10 trillion versus 2% of $30 trillion is, is so, you know, if you're pushing for an expansion of credit and you're getting a margin on that, then it's actually expanding the volume of credit where you, you can... You know they can lobby to increase their profits effectively, and and so the question is, who who does the Federal Reserve report to? Because I suspect their influence at the Bank of International Settlements has a has a large say in the overall outcome. Uh, yeah, so so there's all of these issues that I think are worth um, reflecting on. So in, yeah, and, and you know they do they have a big say in interest rates, they have a big say in uh, FX um, rates. Um, which you know are, are two of the most important factors uh, that drive drive any any economy. Yes, and so the RBA tends to be a bit coy on some of these things. But another issue that they're coy on is Australia's gold, right? Which sits, well, in theory at least, over in the Bank of England. That's right, and, and that's more of a look. As I said to someone last week, I don't expect them to ever admit. Uh, to ever bring the, our gold home. It, I shouldn't be laughing when I say that because, you know, I don't know why they don't. I don't know why they just sit there and expect us, you know, it, it's okay to leave it in England. And that's it in itself seems strange, uh, um, you know, in itself. But it's even stranger when the RBA have admitted that, uh, you know, the Bank of England admitted to them that they've had fake gold bars and duplicate serial numbers. And they also know that serial numbers, the, the date of refining on, on our gold bars, I've seen that the serial numbers um, of our gold bars, I've asked for them. And actually, I was quite surprised the RBA actually gave me those numbers. They, they've given it to me in confidence. Um, and, but I am, I am withholding the right to actually release those serial numbers because as far as I'm concerned, if they belong to the Australian people, the people should have a right to know what the serial numbers of those gold bars are, step one. But what's even more concerning, and I'm, you know, I'm happy to disclose this, is that the because I think you know, it's the public should know this is that those gold bars have been refined since 2015 onwards. So the earliest gold bar, like so, there's a range of range of gold bars, and there's, and there's a range of data refine refining from 2015 right up to 2020. So you know, question is, where were our gold bars before then? Um, have they been melted down, or, or did they not exist? Um, and you know. Yet again, it's like what, what's been going on with our gold. I mean, I asked Guy DeBail a couple of uh, estimates ago when he was still uh, Deputy Governor, when when did we actually ship our gold to the Bank of England? And he didn't even know. And may, maybe, you know, I, I don't know if we've ever had our gold here in Australia. But it's not just about the $6 billion or 80 tonnes 80 tons worth of gold worth about $6 billion that belongs to the Australian people that, that matters. Gold exports in 2021 were worth $28 billion to Australia. Um, and that's probably gone higher since the gold price has been a bit higher lately. So it could quite possibly be over thirty billion in the last year or so. That's you know that's fifty percent of what our iron ore and coal exports. I think they both do about sixty billion. In the last time I looked, when I am a year out of date, but um, coal might be a bit higher this year. But um, you know that, that's thirty billion dollars worth of exports. That if if the RBA are colluding with other central banks to lease gold, and Alan Greenspan admitted in the late nineties, he said that when he was uh, head of the uh, Federal Reserve uh, 
in the US, he said, look, if the gold price takes off, central banks will, will lease gold out to keep the price down. Um, and I suspect that's the same thing now. Now, the RBA, uh, you know, uh, have, have, as far as I'm concerned, misled me last week. They've misled me before because they claim that by leasing gold out, it actually helps the producers. That's complete and utter rubbish because if you're leasing gold, you're actually forward selling gold. Um, uh, and when miners hedge, and, and some, you know, miners have to hedge, they want to lock in some prices so that they've got certainty of income, uh, they're also forward selling gold. So you can't have both sides doing the same thing. If, if the RBA was um, supposedly helping producers with their hedging, they would be buying that gold at a fixed price today for some time in the future, but they're not, they're leasing it out. So that, that you know, yet again, they just get away with lying and estimates um, because they seem to think that we don't know what we're talking about. So, yeah, there, there are a number of issues I have with the RBA um, as well as many other departments. We won't go there today, but, um, yeah. So just on the RBA, uh, they've reported a deficit. Does that matter? Well, it does matter because you're going to either they, to, to basically sort that deficit out, you've got to do one or two things, and that is either the Australian taxpayer will have to uh, put an equity deposit into the RBA um, or the RBA will have to print money um, and that uh, to, to pay that deficit off. So, yes, uh, and, and this is, yet again, I think uh, Michelle Bullock said this last week to Senator Canavan. She said, oh, that's all right. We can just print our way out of this. You know, it, it's only um, our money. <laughs> it's yeah. only money. <laughs> yeah, it's only money. Now, now, technically, she's right. But yet again, you know, there, there's good debt and bad debt or there's, there's what I call responsible uh, money creation and irresponsible money creation. And obviously, if you print and spend, that's bad. And the reason why we're in that debt at the moment is because, number one, that term funding facility is that they've lent very cheap money to uh, the banks um, and now, you know, we're paying, the RBI is suspect of paying more for it. Um, they're, they're paying 3% back to the banks while receiving 0.1% or whatever, you know, the, the margin may be. Well, that, that $6 billion or $3 billion you worked out would be part of the rest of that deficit. Um, and somewhere along the line... Uh, you know, they were obviously losing money, and they're not. They're not. You know, it's, they're not losing money on an infrastructure bank, for example. Um, so, where have they lost that money? And, and I can only suspect it's through consumption, some form of consumption, somewhere down, you know, somewhere along the line. Uh, so, um, they've clearly mismanaged their cash flows, and, and it's all very well to say that we we will. You know, over time, because they're holding bonds, I think that deficit's because of bonds that they've held. So they bought bonds at, say, 0.2%, and now because the interest rates are 3%, using a, a net present value, that would discount the bonds down to, say, $50 or whatever. When they and, and, and they're right when they say that, okay, well, when it, when it matures, we'll get our $100 face value back. That is correct. But $100 when it matures in five years' time, if that's when the maturity date is, is not the same as the hundred dollars that went in back in twenty twenty because when you've got seven percent inflation, say over five years, the value of a hundred dollars has depreciated. You know, not not using exponential numbers here by thirty five percent. So, um, yeah, it, it, it's you know, it's they're right in what they say they can get the face value back, but the fact is the face value of a hundred dollars in five years time isn't what, what it's worth when it first came on to the market. So. Um, but you know, just it, it's the RBA is just one great big wasted opportunity that I see them and 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 a, and a step one and step two they have been destructive because they they lowered interest rates along with the other world central banks far too low, they blew the bubble up far too high, and now they're going to try and pop the bubble far too quickly. And by all means, I do think that the um, interest rates have to rise because because they did go too low. But you know, they should use a mixture of not just qualitative. Um, easing, i.e. Mess- or, or tightening in this case, you know, adjusting interest rates. They could use quantitative easing through the volume of credit, as we've discussed, by being productive. But there's also um, APRA out there sitting on the sidelines, APRA, sorry, sitting out there on the sidelines, um, not making any macro prudential changes. So why not increase, you know, you might need 25% for a deposit instead of 20% for a deposit. Or why not say to banks, well, we're going to restrict the amount of you can do on home loans uh, to say 50% of your book and you need to put the other 50% into, uh, you know, manufacturing or, or small business. Yeah, they, they, they're not even looking at macro credential measures. I mean, I don't know what APRA do. APRA do. 
They're just just a waste of space, those guys. Um, and they should never have been separated from the RBA back in the late 90s either. Um, because, you know, to me, you know, macro prudential measures should work in hand in hand with qualitative easing slash tightening, you know, qualitative measures along with quantitative measures of, of working with the volume of capital. I mean, effectively, we've outsourced um, quantitative easing to the foreign capital markets, um, which is double speak for relying on pretty much the US dollar, the 144A market in the US. Um, so we expand our right side of our balance sheet, our, our, our capital side or credit side of the balance sheet, or just entirely through debt um, instead of equity. Now, people go, oh, well, you can't issue, you know, can't print money or all that sort of stuff. Well, it's not, you don't have to look at it as printing money. Look at it as when a company issues new shares to start up a new, you know, sometimes they might issue new shares because they want to build a new mine or something like that. You can look at an infrastructure bank as the same as a private company issuing, issuing new shares. You know, the bank, you know, um, you know, the government, federal government could come out and say we're going to issue new shares in an um, infrastructure bank that's going to go out and start building assets. We'll put those shares uh, in, in to, you know, into our, our books as equity uh, and then from that you, you match it with assets, productive assets. I mean, that's what they do in the private market. I mean, they, they don't say in the private market, well, you can't, you can't issue new shares. I mean, companies issue new shares all the time. If it, you know, and hopefully, a lot of the time, the new shares are, are, are a wise investment, and and they're not always a wise investment. But when they're not a wise investment, you don't hear the um, free marketeers going, "Oh, well, you know, you can't you can't issue new shares." I mean, there's hit and miss and all of this stuff. I mean, it always comes down to quality of management. <clears throat> and don't get me wrong, the quality of management amongst our governments. Um, here in Australia have been pretty ordinary in the last three or four decades. But, um, you know, we have to always strive to, you know, um, do well and be productive. And um, on that very thought, um, particularly the role of APRA and ASIC and the RBA, it seems to me that they've got a sort of a bit of a bias towards the big end of town and towards supporting the financial system and and the banks, and I always come back to this question, but what about ordinary households and what about ordinary businesses? What about them? They don't get a look in. Um, that's pretty much it, isn't it? I mean, unfortunately, they pay a high rate of tax. Uh, they get very little sort of direct assistance. I mean, you know, look, 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 there's government assistance, you know, things like childcare and all of these things. But, you know, in terms of small business, I mean, there is household support, um, but there's very little small business support. And, uh, you know, if anything, they're the ones that and small business are the ones that are going to cop it through the higher power prices uh, or higher taxes, you know, uh, uh, you know, our onshore tax rate, company tax rates, 30 cents offshore, company tax rate, depending on tax treaties, between zero and 15 cents for big multinationals. Um, we're, we're never going to be able to compete on a just on a on a taxation basis with uh, foreign companies in Australia either because they can shift their profits offshore. Um, just through the right sort of tax structuring, which I know a lot about because that's the industry I used to work in. Um, uh, and, you know, no one understands that. No one understands the offshore tax rates in this country now, tax treaties now, withholding tax structure. Um, so our, our small business are left behind and, and, and we can see that effectively uh, as a percentage of the economy that, you know, our small business struggle um, and slowly bit by bit, you know, we see big companies buying out farmers, big companies dominating a lot of the sectors and unfortunately when big companies do that, big companies today are, are controlled by huge uh, fund managers, uh, wealth managers who um, are more, you know, they're lazy. We have so much lazy capital lying around today because it's all too easy, especially in Australia because of superannuation, to basically drive up the, va you know, the value of um, the stock market, what I call the secondary market. So asset prices can increase. Um, but true productivity gains are very hard to come by. And that's because, you know, and the, the, the people that work in the ivory palace, palaces of Sydney and Melbourne uh, don't know actually how to run a business. They know, they know how to, you know, put type numbers into a spreadsheet and, and prepare annual accounts and, and look at their, you know, run, run an Excel chart on, um, you know, how much their shares have increased by and do pie charts and et cetera, et cetera. But we really need more people on the ground being more productive, you know, and, and, and to do that, you know, it touches on all those issues we had before with taxation and monetary measures. But, but, but that presumably also means that we should be thinking quite carefully about what the mandate of ASIC and APRA and the RBA 
actually is because it seems to me that actually we're not getting the value that we should from those entities at the moment. They're not actually taking um, you know, the, the interests of ordinary Australians into account. They, they tend to be sort of steering a particular path, as we said, based on neoliberalism. We've got a review of ASIC underway, the RBA underway at the moment. Should APRA also be reviewed, do you think? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you know, they, they're living under a rock or something. They, they do not get enough scrutiny. And I believe APRA should come back in under the RBA. And I actually believe the RBA should come back under the Treasury because we need to work hand in hand. You know, Treasury, you know, fiscal policy should work with monetary policy, should work with, you know, and under monetary policy, you've got qualitative easing, quantitative easing and macro prudential measures. So, you know, at the moment, we've got all these different organisations uh, and the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing, um, and, and we can see we can see that. I mean, politicians have now stepped right back, and when it comes to monetary policy, and they say, "Oh, well, we can't discuss. You know, we don't want to be seen to influence um, monetary policy, whether interest rates should go up, or go down." But what, why shouldn't they? When interest rates went down very low, and pensioners were getting half a percent on their money if they were lucky, and then that impacted our deeming, the deeming rates by which you pay out the pension, which then meant you had to pay more of a pension. Qualitative easing, you know, the price of money does impact fiscal measures as well. So it, it, it's absurd that the Treasurer of the day and the Parliament of the day doesn't have some input and, and should be able to have influence on where those interest rates should go. Now, the argument was originally when I think Keating made the RBA independent and then I think Costello added to that somehow, uh, was that, oh, you can't trust politicians, they'll just drive interest rates to zero because it's all too popular to do that. It'll be too, you know, that'll be the easy solution. Well, guess what? Here we are, you know, 30 <laughs> years later and interest rates were driven to zero. Yep. Um, and ultimately that was in response to the COVID fear-mongering and the daily press conferences and, we'll, you know, we're all going to die from COVID. So uh, everything just got thrown out uh, out the out the door. You know, all, all that solid economic, um, sound economic management got thrown out the door. Um, so it, it's made a, um, uh, you know, it, it's shown up the, the fallacy of the RBA is truly independent because they're not truly independent at all. They panic along with everyone else. Um, and, and, you know, here we are. And, and they were going that way anyway before COVID. Interest rates were very low. Um, so, you know, why not? And, and, you know, so why not make monetary policy accountable to the people? Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Well, I think there's a very important conversation we had ahead about that, so uh, we'll, we'll continue to press. But there's one other important conversation I wanted to touch on before we close. We're looking at um, an interesting environment where there are central bank digital currency pilots running now in Australia and other countries around the world. There's a discussion about digital identification and how that could be used on one side. And on the other side, we're seeing the closure of a lot of regional bank branches and the removal of ATMs and the restriction of cash. And so my question here is, have we lost the plot in terms of thinking about how ordinary people use their money and you know, how we should be actually putting the infrastructure in place to be able to support them? Yeah, look, look uh, about losing the plot, we have lost the plot in many ways. Digital currency is a, is a natural result of technology making the world much smaller. Um, now, there's two aspects to cut. Well, currency as we used to know it, was a monetary thing that was, you know, uh, facilitated the exchange of goods and services, right? I mean, it was, and that was the end of it. Now, of course, it's used as an identification, well, has the potential to be used as a means of identification if it, you can tie it into, you know, your vaccine passport or your carbon credit account or whatever that will be. So we've now got a new dimension to, to this whereby it can become a controlling feature rather than a, you know, a, 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 um, a, a service that helped us exchange goods goods and services and and that's you know where, where we're going with digital currency and, and where the bank's going with digital currency is where the bureaucracy and governments have gone over the last 30 or 40 years where they've sold all the infrastructure that provides services and and the government's moved away from a body that was meant to service and it has now become a body that's controlling this well likewise this is the risk that with banks and governments of course will work hand in hand with banks where they will no longer service uh but you know they have the the you know, this digital currency will give them the ability to control us. You know, you'll go to your bank account and they'll go, oh, sorry, um, you can't withdraw $100 this on, on Friday afternoon because you've already used up all your carbon credits for the week or, you know, you haven't got your 56th jab um, or whatever. So definitely, definitely threats, you know, uh, potential threats from a digital currency. 
um, uh, you know, h- h- how, you know, it, and, and this begs the question yet again, if they're, they're going to start talking about a digital currency, central banks, that's all the more reason that they should be very transparent and accountable to the people, actually. And I'll tie that in next time to question estimates because um, it's a real, it is, it's it, look, definite potential risk uh, with this uh, digital currency. But because you've got to be careful in my game if I jump ahead too far, um, you know, you can't really, one of the tricks of the trade I've learned in this business is not to impute motive. So I can't get too far ahead of myself or I'll be called a conspiracy theorist and shut down. Um, but, you know, we know that China uses social credit, you know, there's facial recognition out there and that's, you know, I know Current Affair have run um, segments on facial recognition. So, you know, the, the technology is out there now for a potential big brother to control us in a number of ways. Um, now, you know, it should also be said that technology can be used in a lot of good ways. It's like water, for example, you know, you need it to drink and survive, stay hydrated, uh, but you can also drown in it. Likewise, fire, you can warmth, but you can also burn to death from it. So um, uh, I, I struggle to see the benefits of digital currency being, I, I actually fail to see much upside in digital currency at all, to be honest with you. Um, uh, you know, I'd say there's a lot more downside to digital currency than, up, than upside because, yeah, we, we, we've already got currencies that work quite well now. Um, but and, and currencies really should just stay as you know, a means to exchange goods and services rather than any form of control. And just going back to the branches, the other side of the story, because in regional Australia, branches are being stripped. Um, Dale Webster from the regionals now showing that we've got less than 1,000 branches across you know major, major regional areas, and they're dropping like a stone at the moment. Um, what do we need to do about this? Because there was a regional task force review that, frankly, I think came out with a rather biased set of recommendations. And it seems to me that there's a very important conversation that we should be having about social obligations of the financial services player and the need to ensure that cash and other services are still embedded in those regional areas. Exactly right, Martin. And that's why we need a postal bank um, to complement the infrastructure bank. Uh, the postal bank shouldn't be a prime bank, so to speak. It should be just a, a normal savings bank, but it should be set up in every regional town. Um, I'm firmly of the belief that a combined private-public system, so, for example, schools, we have private schools and public schools, uh, just forgetting the way it's funded, but, yeah, or let's go to hospitals, for example. Private hospitals keep, you know, uh, a level of quality assurance that if public hospitals get too bad, people go to Private hospitals, likewise, private hospitals get too expensive, they'll go back to public hospitals. So there's a natural sort of a, a stabiliser effect where one will keep the other honest. And I genuinely think one of the reasons why the banking industry, uh, you know, turned into a bunch of cowboys in the last 20 years was that the sale of CBA didn't keep a lid on, you know, bad practices in the banking industry. And I really think the banking industry, forget the, I'm not saying everything in the Royal Commission, don't forget the stuff in the Banking Royal Commission, which wasn't really a banking Royal Commission, it was more like a, you know, a, a, a bad practices um, commission in the sense that, you know, the recent Banking Royal Commission didn't look at monetary policy and things like that. It just looked at, the, you know, malpractice, right? But the best way to, to keep that um, bad behaviour in the private banks under wraps is to have a is to have a public bank uh, like the old CBA. I grew up with the CBA. You know, I've still got CBA accounts, you know, Bank of Strength, um, and that kept the private banks honest and, and – uh, you know, and the same for government insurance offices. I've just got the 40% increase in uh, my house, um, you know, in insurance. I have to re- pick up every time I get my, you know, insurance bill, it's up by double digits. And it's been like that for about the last five years. We need to bring back, you know, a, a retail bank. We need an infrastructure bank. You do quantitative easing through that for productive means. Uh, you know, you can have a uh, retail bank, postal bank that services all the communities. And it can be a one-stop shop for a number of services. You know, you can... Um, also, I know I think there's a real need with that postal bank to have insurance services offered through that. I personally, I was never happy with that $10 billion reinsurance pool. I just felt that, you know, that, that was making it too easy for the private insurance companies. They will gouge some of that $10 billion. Um, you know, the best way, yeah, so, so yes, long, long story short, Mark, we talked about this for a long time, but, yes, definitely go back to having a, a private, uh, sorry, public uh, you, know, you can call it a post office bank or whatever. We'll call it a post office bank um, that that does uh, serve regional communities uh, as as well as provide you know uh, yeah you know, uh, essential banking and financial services at a reasonable cost, um, and that that is insurance and banking services. 
So just on that policy point, um, what, what, how would that best be pro progressed? Do we need an inquiry or something? Or I mean, because there's quite a lot of people now saying the banking system doesn't work for ordinary Australians and ordinary businesses at the moment, and look, all these bank branches are being closed. But there's no real momentum to say, well, we need to find that alternative path. So w what's the policy lever that we need to pull? Well, I mean, ultimately... You know, we, we just need to put pressure on the treasurer of the day and the executive of the day and the current government of the day. Um, we can have another inquiry, and I'm, I'm, I'm keen to actually do that. Um, I'm, I'm keen, I'd like to have one for the regional, red, Rural and Regional Affairs um, Senate um, Committee. And um, But even if we get that up, even if the recommendation was we need a postal bank, we then need to get convinced the treasurer of the day, Jim Chalmers, that that's what we need. He will get a lot of pushback from the private banks and also the uh, super funds, uh, of which a large chunk is the industry super funds controlled by the unions because they now own industry funds, own over 20% of all of big four companies, uh, big four banks, sorry. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's about getting the right person, um, you know, the people who have the power to make the right decision. Uh, and that will come over time. Look, it's interesting, you know, I, I the younger generation doesn't, care as much they're so used to online services they're not so wedded to the idea of a um uh you know a physical bank in that town um but i i think that the physical you know you, you need a physical bank there and um you know that can also you know if, if you tied it in with somehow not necessarily with Soundlink, but you know if they're next to you know if you've got that one-stop shopping there um it, i just think it'll make things easier yeah, and of course, a lot of businesses are still taking cash and need to take cash. I was talking to somebody in. Um, yeah, actually, that's a good point. Yeah, I forgot about that. Sorry. Yeah, a big, a bit, uh, talking to somebody in a big regional town who said we've just lost lost our last branch. Now all the businesses they've either got to make a decision: do they stop taking cash, which of course is what the banks would like them to do, or do they continue to take cash and then have to work out what to do with it? And the answer is they've got to drive a long way up the road just to deposit yeah. cash at the next city. So the problem is that if you actually don't allow, um, you know, the free movement of, of commerce in the town, you strangle the town. Actually, that is an excellent point. I did not uh, think of that. Um, and now that you've said that, that is an excellent point about the ability for small business to go and deposit their, their coins and cash overnight with the bank and let the bank put it in their safe. Um, that yeah, and, and I mean, my small town of Chinchilla is eighty kilometres, no, eighty three kilometres from Dolby. So if you had to drive to Dolby every night to park your cash, uh, pe people are soon going to work out, you know, uh, that all those businesses, if they didn't go to Dolby, they're going to have money lying around. So that 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 is a very very good point that I hadn't have thought of. So thanks for telling me about that because I will raise that as an issue. Well, thank you. I mean, I think it's a very important part of the broader discussion. I'm not anti-digital, and, you know, I think it's quite good that you can do a lot online, but I do think there's a very critical role for cash. And, of course, when the power disappears, and, you know, like we saw in uh, southern New South Wales when we had all the floods, the only thing that actually worked was cash because nothing else worked. So that's the other reason why it's important. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. It's a very good point. Well, Senator, I want to say thank you very much for spending some time. You clearly have a very busy agenda, lots on at the moment, but uh, the fact you're able to come and uh, take a chunk of time out and share some of your thoughts on those very important issues, thank you for that. And, uh, you know, perhaps in the new year, you, you, if you're willing, you come back on the live GFA because I know that my audience will be very keen to be able to explore some of these things a bit further. Oh, I'd love to. Thanks, Martin. Yeah, and, and thanks for having me on. It's been great to talk some economics for a change. <laughs> thank you very much. Really appreciate your time. Cheers. Thanks, Martin.